Morning Girl by Michael Doris. Chapter One, Morning Girl. The name my family calls me is Morning Girl because I wake up early, always with something on my mind. Mother says it's because I dream too hard and that I don't relax even in sleep. Maybe she's right. In my dreams, I'm always doing things, swimming or searching on the beach for unbroken shells or figuring out a good place to fish. I open my eyes as soon as the light calls through the smoke hole in the roof, sift the ideas that have come to me in the night, and decide which one to follow first. I don't tell this to anyone because they might misunderstand, but I like the aloneness of the early morning. I try to step gently on the path so that the sounds I make will blend into the rustle of the world. Father taught me how to swim on land, careful as a turtle. You'll see more if you're quiet, he told me. Things don't hide or wait for you to pass, and it's more polite. Another thing, if the day starts before you do, you never catch up. You spend all your time running after what you should have already done, and no matter how much you hurry, you never finish the race in a tie. The day wins. I tried to once explain all this to my little brother, but he just blinked at me, asked me who said it was a race in the first place. See, he likes the darkness best, especially when there are no clouds and no moon. Sometimes he shakes me until I look as he points out the patterns he sees in the sky, the tracks made of white sand. He's sure what we see is part of another island, even bigger than the one where we live or than the one that appears in a pond when the water is very smooth. He thinks we're like birds floating above that sky island, very, very high. I don't know how my brother came to see everything so upside down from me. For him, night is day. Sleep is awake. It's as though time is split between us and we only pass by each other as the sun rises or sets. Usually for me, that's enough. Mother promises that someday my brother and I will be friends, like she and her brother, Sharptooth, finally got to be. She whispers when she tells stories of how my uncle acted when he was a boy. How twice he laughed at her when she got into trouble or how he told a lie and never untied it, ever, with the truth. She became very still, closed her eyes, and took a deep breath at that memory. But then she shook her head, looked into me the way only she can do, and said that she used to believe she'd never forget what he had done. But look, she has. And now Sharp Tooth is exactly the brother she wants, the person in the whole world who remembers important things from when she was a young girl, who remembers grandfather when he is, was alive and before he grew old. I don't answer what I think, that my brother is different from hers, because my brother is her son. Mother doesn't know him as others do, as I do. When he's away from her sight, he eats too much. When she isn't there to hear him, he doesn't understand how to be quiet. And who knows what he does all night while the rest of us are asleep. Just before dawn today, I woke and found him sitting on the edge of my mat, watching me with big eyes. What's the matter? I asked him. My voice was not soft. He wouldn't let me be alone even at night. Nothing, he said. What do you want? You're always complaining. I'm not the one who stares like a duck, I answered. I'm not the one who can't stay asleep like a normal person. Ghosts, father sighed from his hammock. My house is filled with ghosts. They talk to each other all night. I have to build a new house. I'll live there in peace. It will be wonderful. Oh, yes, I'll come with you. Mother's voice was unhappy as a fish pulled into the air from the sea. Let's escape from such cruel ghosts who will not let people have their rest. I could have explained that it was my brother's fault, but it would have done no good. Father would only have made more jokes and mother would have said, we'll listen later, morning girl. I stood up, squeezed the stiffness from the back of my neck, and gave my brother a parting frown that I hoped would leave him very worried. That did no good either, for he was already back on his own mat, curled into a comfortable position, pretending to be dreaming. His eyes were dozed tightly, and his mouth was smiling. Outside, at least, belonged to me, since no one else was around. I could do anything, go anywhere. I could walk or run. I could, I could climb or swim. I could watch the ocean or slip into the mango grove, keep very quiet until the birds forgot I was there and began to talk to one another again. The day welcomed me, brushed my hair with its breeze and greeted me with its songs. I raised my arms high and stretched, 
I let the rich scent of the large red flowers color my thoughts, and the perfume gave me an idea of how to use my special time. I would search for the most beautiful blossoms and weave them together into necklaces for father and mother. If I hurried, I could finish before they rose for the second time, and they would find my gifts waiting at the entrance to our house. As I was working, my mind rushed ahead to what I knew was sure to happen. Mother would come outside first, see the necklaces, and go back in to get father. Then they would return to the doorway together, him rubbing his eyes and grumbling until he noticed what lay at his feet. Look at this, he would cry as if he were completely surprised, and mother would press her hands together and say, how unusual, how well made. Where could these amazing necklaces have come from? Mother and father would ask each other as they placed my flowers around their necks. And they would still be wearing them, still be happy with me, when finally, late in the morning, long after everyone else, my brother woke up.